Welcome to video 6.1a, Waves and Vibrations and the General Properties of Waves. Some of our animations will be using Dr. Dan Russell from Penn State's Graduate Program of Acoustics Animations, as well as some from FET. Let's take a look at this animation. We can see that the wave is moving from left to right across the screen, and you can notice that there are some red particles individually pointed out throughout the wavefront. If you notice that these particles are not really moving too much, this one here with the big arrow under it is moving slightly left and right, back and forth about an equilibrium point. This is an example of what a sound wave would look like, and you can see that even though the wave energy moves a long distance all the way across the screen, the particles really don't move all that far. Now if we look at this animation here, again we have a wave front moving from left to right and you can see this move. If we look at this particle right here, it's not moving left to right, it's only oscillating up and down. This particular type of wave is called a transverse wave. Its particles are moving perpendicular to the direction of motion, so while the particle is moving up and down, the wave is moving left to right. The previous animation the particles and the waves are moving in the same direction, or at least parallel to each other, and this is called a longitudinal wave. So between these two different types of waves, we can see that the particle motion and the wave motion are different from each other. When we talk about waves, we want to remember that waves are vibrations that are moving from a source, and they're produced by the source moving um, or oscillating up and down. And they actually vibrate in all directions, in all three directions. We just tend to only look at them as two-dimensional. Let's take a look at some different waves here. Let's first start with this wave here. It's called a longitudinal wave, as I said, where the direction of motion of the wave is parallel to the direction of motion of the particles. The best example of this is um, if we take a look at a drum head, then we know that, for example, when we first beat on the head of the drum, we have this situation. And in this situation, the particles that were right in front of the drum before it was hit are at one distance apart. But now, because the drum has been compressed inwards, these particles in here all have some extra space, so they have less density. There's a lot of an expansion there. That expansion is called a rarefaction and rarefaction is a word that your book actually doesn't use for some reason. If we look at the opposite side, once the drum has been released, it's going to push out and rebound, and then all the particles that were just allowed to expand are now going to be contracted together, and this is our compression. So the particles are being pushed together or allowed to expand in a certain area, but then the energy continues to move across. And again, this is what the first animation looked like. This kind of wave is the transverse wave. With a transverse wave, the direction of motion of the wave is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the particles. As we can see here, this hand is moving up and down with holding the rope and vibrating it up and down, but the wave is moving from the left to the right. Makes a nice wave sign. This is what we typically think about as with a wave is the uh, sine wave for mathematics. Light waves are transverse waves, sound waves are longitudinal waves. We oftentimes look at both light and sound in the format of a transverse wave because it's easier to see things and it's easier to describe them in this format as a transverse wave than it is when they are looking like the longitudinal waves that they really are. So let's take a look at some characteristics of waves. We have the amplitude of the wave. The amplitude is related to the intensity. It's not the exact same thing, but it is related, and it gives us a good idea of how much energy was put into the source as it was moving. The more energy the source has, the larger the amplitude has. The maximum points of this transverse wave are called crests. This is when the particles have moved the farthest from the rest line. And this black line here in the center is considered to be the rest line. This is where the rope would be sitting if it had not been vibrated at all. The minimum points of the wave are the troughs. 
Now, just because it's a minimum doesn't mean that there's actually a minimum amount of energy there. Because the rope has been moved from its rest point, it has quite a bit of energy, both kinetic and elastic potential energy. The crest and the trough are distinguished so that we can tell if we're talking about the top half of the wave or the bottom half of the wave, which will become important later on. Then notice also that we have the distance from one point on the wave to another point on the wave, and this is called the wavelength. The wavelength is, as its name suggests, how far it is, the distance from one point on the wave to the next identical point on the wave. It's super easy to tell up here that the wavelength, or lambda, which is its symbol, is from the crest to the crest. We can also measure a wavelength from the trough to the trough. We can really pick any points we want to measure the wavelength from. If I take this point here, right where it crosses the rest point, and I want to find out a wavelength, I have to be careful not to choose this part. While the particles are going across the rest area at that point, over here where we first started, the particles are on the way down to below the rest area, whereas here they're on the way up. So that is not a full wavelength. It's here when the particles are back on the way down again that we can say, all right, that's a full wavelength, not the halfway in between. So wavelength is typically measured in meters, although some of the waves that we're going to be dealing with are going to have extremely small wavelengths, so we might need to use nanometers, and some of the other ones may have larger wavelengths. We don't typically go much beyond a kilometer, though, with a wavelength. The transverse wave is the wave that we're looking at first because you can see all of these different parts to it, and they're really easy to recognize. If we continue on and want to look at longitudinal waves and find out their characteristics, we'll see that we can't find quite as many characteristics on a longitudinal wave as a transverse wave. So if we look at these two together, we see that we have our transverse wave looking as it always has. We have our longitudinal wave. It's super easy on a transverse wave to say, yep, from this trough to this trough, there's a wavelength. Its length is lambda, and away we go. But if we look at a longitudinal wave, what are we going to do for a wavelength? Well, you can see here that they've distinguished it by saying the center of a compression to the center of a compression is a wavelength. We can do the same with an expansion. We can go from the center of an expansion to the center of an expansion, and also get a wavelength. The problem is that finding the exact center of an expansion or a rarefaction and a compression is pretty difficult to do. Oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take this longitudinal wave and we will convert it and make it look like a transverse wave so that we can find these things. So if we look at this longitudinal wave now, you see here we have a compression we have a compression, there's another one here, and there's another one here. If we look at it in terms of the density of the air that this wave is moving through, we'll notice that the maximum density is going to occur at these compressions. The minimum densities occur here during these rarefactions. So while we can't necessarily measure this wavelength too accurately just because you can't tell where the center is, it's much easier to do that if we can measure the wavelength based on the density wave of it. It becomes a perfect transverse wave even though we're getting information from a longitudinal wave instead. So a rarefaction becomes the bottom part of the transverse wave below the rest point, and the compressions become the top of it. So from the perspective of densities, we can look at longitudinal to be a transverse. A couple of other things about waves that I want to talk about. Um, let's first take a look at water waves. We've got this picture here. came out a little bit blurry, but we can still see it. In the deep ocean, you'll notice that there's a large portion at the bottom of the ocean where the water is undisturbed. Doesn't matter what's happening up top, that'll stay the same. Then we get to the wave base. The wave base is where the energy that's been put into the water from the wind or from something else dropping into it, um, that's how far down that, that energy affects. And as you go up from the wave base towards the top, you'll notice that just like in any other of the waves that we were talking about, the particles 
just move in a little space around an equilibrium point. The difference is that with water waves, rather than the particles just oscillating up and down or side to side, they're actually rotating in a circular pattern. So each particle is going around in a circle as the wave is moving towards the shore. There's also this level near the top of the wave, near the crest of the wave, that is still. It's not moving up and down, and it will remain the same height throughout. Then, as we move the wave towards the shore, this area of undisturbed water underneath is getting smaller and smaller, until we get to the point where the wave base is interacting with the ocean, with the uh, shoreline. And when that occurs, then things start to change. Our vertical circular motion of the water molecules now tends to become flatter and more oval. And that when that occurs, there's going to be more of an upward push towards the water. So oftentimes when we get to the shallow parts of the ocean, the waves start to change their shape and the back seems to pile up on them while the front decreases. And that is because of this non-circular rotation that's occurring now. It's also because all of the energy that was moving this water here has to go somewhere. Some of that energy does get transferred to the sand, but most of it gets transferred upwards into pushing some water up. So these crests here, as we can see, tend to be higher than the crests here. And then eventually what will happen is this front point will go so far over that it will actually fall and it will break. Let's take a look at some wave pulses so we can look at this in a little bit more detail. So we're back on FET again, looking at um, a wave on a string. But we're gonna just, I'm just gonna send one pulse down we can notice that it goes down and it hits the clamp and it comes back a little bit. The amplitude has changed drastically. Let's just do this in slow motion for once. You can see that the particles go up and down as the amplitude and the wave carries on. It loses some of its energy because it's just one pulse. There's a lot of friction here. Let's change this to being no end so the rope will just continue forever and ever. And uh, let's send one more pulse down. Again, it's slow motion, so you can see each of the particles going up and down. They still lose a little bit of energy, but not too much. If we go back to normal, amplitude goes up and it comes down, so the energy causes the wave to go up and then down above the zero point. It's not circled around, it's not centered around the zero point because of the way that this is working. We can get this to oscillate, and it will go back and forth, and we're going to talk more about oscillations shortly, but to, in order to be able to look at the amplitude of these waves oftentimes, what we want to do is we want to just look at one pulse and figure out what's actually going to happen when one pulse goes through. So at this point, we have the characteristics of both transverse and longitudinal waves. We'll get to how we calculate things about the wavelength in our next video.